Okay, welcome everybody to today's lecture on decision making and social cognition. And as you'll see here in the topics we cover today, uh, we have um, the reasoning or decision making is two different subtopics, and then we have the topic of social cognition finally. <clears throat> Just wait one second. Okay, sorry for that. The article, uh, the rec recommended reading for today, um, refers to this part in decision making, and you will see that it's by Tversky and Kahneman, and uh, they made quite a good study on some specific heuristic here. We will speak about that later. Okay, so let's start with an introduction into the topic of reasoning. And uh, when we speak about reasoning, then we have to, um, or then one of the definitions we see is that reasoning is defined as uh, that we derive conclusions and make inf inferences by applying the laws of logic. So it seems like we are really rational and think about things, make inferences and then apply that. So we have <coughs> this assumption implicit in this definition that we actually do follow the laws of logic and that we are rational. However, as we will see today throughout basically the whole lectures, humans are usually not very rational. So you all are probably familiar with Star Trek and Mr. Spock usually is an example of a rational being. And you already may notice the difference between Spock and the normal humans. So humans are usually not rational. So reasoning, or in the context of reasoning, when we research reasoning, then we have the situation that basically all the necessary information which we need to come to a conclusion is given so that we know everything and we can then apply the laws of logic to come to the best conclusion. To differentiate that from decision making, in decision making we don't have all information available. So we have to use like laws of probability and then use heuristics to come to a conclusion because we don't have all information and can just use pure logic. So that's one of the uh, characterizing uh, differences between reasoning and decision making. There are traditionally at least two types of reasoning and one type is called inductive reasoning and in this type of reasoning, we generalize from examples. We will see examples in a moment and speak about this. And then we have deductive reasoning, where we have a set of premises, and from these premises, we derive a conclusion which follows from these premises. And these types of reasoning are not specific to psychology. This is a very generic thing which applies for instance to uh, mathematics as well or to the area of philosophy where people try to think and make uh, inferences based on, on logic and thinking. Okay, let's speak about these two types of reasoning in some more detail. And let's start with inductive reasoning. <clears throat> so as I said, in inductive reasoning, what we are doing is that um, we have, for instance, from our everyday experience, uh, we have several examples or samples or previous experience or something like that. And <clears throat> we generalize that and make a conclusion about that. And usually what you can say is that these conclusions can be very probable or very likely but 
they don't necessarily need to be true. So there could be exceptions to our experiences. <clears throat> and basically, as you will see in examples as well, is that in our everyday life, virtually all our reasoning is inductive. Is, okay, I have that experience, so probably it will be like that in the future as well. So let's have an example. And you may have a turkey who is a scientist. And he says, okay, I'm fed every day. I get food every day. So because that's his experience, he forms this general generalization of a law of an inductive reasoning. I am fed every day. And that may be true for quite a while, but it may not necessarily need to be true for every day. So for instance, when Thanksgiving is approaching, there may come a day where he's not fed anymore and everything changes quite substantially and drastically. So as you can see, this is a type of things um, we do usually in our everyday life. So usually you may take a bus to university or something like that and you know, okay, this bus comes every morning at 9 o'clock and you may have also something like that, it's scheduled at 9 o'clock, but usually it comes at 10 past 9. So this is inductive reasoning and from your experience you directly would say, okay, I know that it's not a law that it will come every morning 10 minutes late. There may be mornings where it's actually on time. <clears throat> One of the very big philosophers of science, Karl Popper, uh, made a statement about inductive reasoning. And because he said, or he said, that in inductive reasoning, as we've seen in these examples, there is never an absolute certainty about things. Because our conclusion derives from examples from the past. So we never can be sure whether the future will be the same by the logic we apply. So what he said is we should never, never, ever use inductive reasoning to prove scientific hypothesis. Because that's a wrong way of thinking. Instead he proposed uh, a process of which is called falsification. In a way that he said in a very um, in a very extreme point of view, that you never can prove a hypothesis. You can always only falsify it by providing one example which disproves it. But to prove something, you would always need to investigate all the examples or something like that. So an example which is often used in this context is the hypothesis, hypothesis all swans are white. And from our experience, we know that many, many, many swans are white. And if we wouldn't have internet and everything available and TV or stuff like that, and we would only go in our direct environment, we may observe that all swans are actually white. However, to really prove that hypothesis that all swans are white, we would need to check the color of every single swan in the whole world. And then we could say all swans at the present moment are white. Because it could be that in the next second, somewhere on this earth, a black swan is born. So Popper said, suggested, if you're really going for that, that hypothesis, actually try to find black swans. Do experiments to disprove your hypothesis. And if you fail to do so, then you actually provide more evidence in favor of your hypothesis. Okay, let's have a practical demonstration here of, of this idea, first done by Peter Wason. And I will present three numbers, and they adhere to a particular rule. So you see that. Now your task is to find out the rule. And you can do that by producing three numbers. And I will tell you only whether the numbers you tell me adhere to the sequence or not. By saying yes or no. Okay, so two, four, six. Anybody 
wants to test a rule. You can't see a rule in there. You can't come up with a hypothesis. Okay. Now just produce three numbers which you think are good to test the rule and I will say yes it adheres to the rule or no it doesn't. Uh, yes. Any other ideas? Yes. If you think you know the rule, you can write it down. Any other ideas? Okay. What do you think is the rule? Anybody has any idea about a rule? Sorry? One, two, three? Yes. Sorry? No. <laughs> Just tr produce further numbers, then you may test it. Okay, so what happens here is that when you have that, most people assume that it increases by 2. And we have seen that in the first two examples when people mentioned that. They said 8, 10, 12 and 1, 3, 5. However, the rule is more basic by numbers in the sequence just increase. And they can increase by any amount. So 1, 2, 3 also follows the rule. As would be 100, 101, 200 or something like that and not necessarily by two. However, what happens and what were the two examples are very prototypical answers to that. And because this is suggestive of a rule that it increases by two. So you immediately get this hypothesis. And that's exactly what Popper meant. So if you start with the hypothesis, oh, it increases by two, you just produce experiments which support your hypothesis. You just create, uh, create new examples which adhere to the rule. And today there was actually an example which is uncommon uh, where people try to test rules which may not adhere to your hypothesis. Your idea is it increases by two. So most people test just that. But why not test whether it increases just by one or generally? Or why not test um, whether it's completely different and say uh, 10, 9, 8 or something like that. Most people don't do that. And this is called the confirmation bias. That we have a very strong tendency to confirm our initial beliefs or our belief system. So and we don't try to disconfirm, falsify that. Although that approach may give us much more information than just coming up with another rule with increase of two, like 10, 12, 14, yes. Okay, uh, 20, 22, 24, yes. Okay, you could go on forever. So with this example. This is all just uh, what I just said. <clears throat> and this is what Popper suggested how science should work as well. Another example of the con confirmation bias, a more practical everyday example which you may have come across, is for instance that you may have a person who says, well, I'm telepathic. And for instance, um, we have this character Tom as an example, he thinks he's telepathic, and he thinks of his friend John and at that moment the phone rings and it actually is John. So he thinks, wow, I'm telepathic because 
I just thought of him and he's ringing. And that happened to me already quite often. So there really must be something about that. However, that is very likely to be just a confirmation bias because Tom remembers only the instances where he thought of somebody and then this person actually called. What he forgets is all the instances where he thought of somebody and this person did not call, did not ring at that very moment. And if you would compare the uh, frequency of these two events, then this is probably much, much more often than this, and it shows that this is probably just accident or chance. This has been put into or investigated in, like, let's say, proper research studies uh, with a confirmation bias. So another example, a study done by Lord in the late 70s, is that he had two groups of participants who had already opinions about uh, the death penalty. And one group were in favor of the death penalty and one group was, was against the death penalty. And as I said, they already had this opinion when they entered the study. And then both groups were given two studies, scientific studies with some evidence. One of the study supports death penalty, for instance by showing if you introduce that, crime rates go down. And another one criticizes death penalty, for instance by showing that introduction of death penalty doesn't change anything to crime rates doesn't do anything, except that you actually kill people yourself. Now both studies you could criticize methodologically and people may, were made aware of that. Like, okay, this has some drawbacks and this has some drawbacks. And that these kind of drawbacks were roughly comparable. So what the result is that both groups thought these two studies confirmed their own view. They saw the methodological shortcomings only in the study which were, went against their own uh, view. So the people uh, pro-death penalty sort, thought um, this is a good study and this is a weak study and the people who are against death penalty thought this is a good study and this is a weak study. So we have to be very cautious in how we perceive information provided to us, that we don't filter it automatically by this confirmation bias to just support our own view, which we already have. <clears throat> okay, so to summarize inductive reasoning, and um, it is making conclusions based generalizing on examples, and this may be potentially wrong. And virtually every reasoning in everyday life is inductive. And we have seen a couple of examples of the confirmation bias, which is a very strong bias that we tend to see evidence only in favor of our own hypothesis. And in, special, in particular in scientific work, we have to be very aware of that because everybody, including researchers and scientists, are prone to that. Okay, let's change to the second way of reasoning, and that is deductive reasoning. And that is where we have these type of logical inferences. Here, as we said already, we have a set of premises or statements, and by them, by these statements, we derive and come to conclusions. And based in this context of the logic, these conclusions will definitely be true if the set of premises is true. So we will see examples in a moment. So there is a definite causality or link between the two. So let's have an example. Basically what we are speaking about is an if-then logic. And there are two ways to use the logic. And again, as I said, these are, if you go into the um, philosophy of science or into science logic, these are rather common terms, so to say, to work with, or mathematics as well. So one is called modus ponens, and that's very simple and straightforward. The premise is, if A, then B. So when A is given, we can infer that B is also. As an example, the premise may be, if it is raining, 
Then Nancy gets wet. It is raining. What can we infer? Nancy gets wet. So that's not really rocket science. We are kind of used to that in everyday life. It is important to remember that this is directional. We cannot infer that if B, then A. If the premise is, um, or when we know that Nancy is wet, we cannot infer it is raining, because Nancy may have had a shower, or may have fallen into a lake, or something like that. So it is directional. I stress that because we now come to modus tollens, which seems very related to the inverse, but it's actually not. So the premise again, if A, then B. And when we know that B is not, then we also know that A is not. So again, as an example, if it is raining, then Nancy gets wet, and not B means Nancy does not get wet. So what can we infer? It's not raining. So if we have this, if A then B, and we know that B is not, then we can surely in conclude, infer that A is not also. And that's different to say when B is given, we can infer that A is also given. The example when Nancy is wet, we don't know whether it's raining or whether we, she had a shower or something. Okay. So people find this modus tollens, making inferences based on that, quite difficult actually. This idea of this is not, so B is not, so A is not. And the other one, if A then B, the straightforward one is much easier. Um, I already want to summarize that at this point and not go into too much detail with the deductic, deductive reasoning. So basically it's really applying laws of logic, if-then rules. And we have the, seen these two subtypes of reasoning, modus ponens and modus tollens. And generally for modus ponens and tollens, people find that very hard. We had extremely plain examples here. But if you put these types of reasoning and uh, hide them a little bit, the information in a longer text, for instance, you provide information which is not directly necessary to make this uh, inferences. So you know a story about Nancy, how she gets up in the morning, and you hide that somewhere, and dilute the information, then people find it very, very difficult to actually come to these conclusions. Okay. So, do you have any questions regarding inductive and deductive reasoning? Okay. So, let's go over to decision making. <clears throat> In the beginning, we said that reasoning, or in reasoning, we have all necessary information to come to a conclusion, and we use the laws of logic. And in decision-making, we don't have all information available, and instead have to use laws of probability and using heuristics. And we'll speak about these heuristics in quite a bit. Now, how do we... Oops, come to decisions if we have to decide about something. And one of the questions research has asked uh, itself is whether humans are so-called maximizers. So do we always try to find the best decision so that we get the maximum benefit from that? And this is of course an important question to try to determine human behavior, in particular for instance in economics or in how do people purchase things. So one idea is that humans make decisions very rational again. So one option could be, for instance, that when we have two different options we can choose from, we assign each option a value. So that we say, okay, that's 
uh, a very good value and that's a rather poor value, for instance. And then we estimate the probability of the option. So how likely it is we will be able to get it. And the best choice to pick then is the one which, uh, with the highest, which is called expected utility. So what we do is we multiply the value we have assigned with the probability of the option. And this is the so-called expected utility. So to give you an example, uh, two or three years ago you probably thought about, okay, where should I, at which university should, should I apply? And you may then follow and think yourself whether you um, came to that decision the same way as is suggested by this model. So you may say, okay, Brunel University has a certain value, let's take the arbitrary value 5, and the probability to be accepted at Brunel, to get an offer, may be 80%, so quite good. So when we multiply 5 with 0.8, then we get an expected utility of 4. So that's for Brunel. Then you may have considered Cambridge. You may say, wow, the value of Cambridge may be quite a bit higher. Let's assign it a value of 30. However, getting an offer from Cambridge may, with your particular grades or whatever, probability only very low, like 10%. You estimate that. And so when you multiply the value of the option with the actual probability of getting there, your expected utility is only 3. So it's actually lower than Brunel in this example. So here, according to that model, if we would be maximizers, we would go for Brunel and not for Cambridge. Okay, now who derived their decision to apply at Brunel via this method? Raise your hands. Okay, nobody. And it has been turned out this is not the way people come to decisions. It is a model, it is a suggestion, but we are usually not maximizers. We are not strictly applying the laws of logic to try to come to the best solution when we have um, to make decisions. So maximizing, as I said, we look for the optimal solution. And for this we actually have to evaluate all alternatives. However, humans are, which has been termed, satisficers. So usually we evaluate a couple of alternatives until we find an acceptable solution. Where we say, okay, I can live with that, and then we go for that. So we are satisfied with that. And we know we may not have the best option, but we stop at that. And it has been shown that this is, for instance, also the case um, in, in like public government. If decisions have to be made, how money is spent or something like that. Then it's often like only a few alternatives are evaluated and we take the best of the ones we think is, or the one we think it's the best or where it's acceptable. So why are we doing that? Because of course it's not beneficial for us to just be satisfied and not get the maximum out of our decisions we make. And here again comes an idea from Herbert Simon. It's the same Simon from Simon and Newell we have encountered a couple of times now in, in these lectures. With the one with the computer models like the general problem solver. And he coined the term bounded rationality or termed it like that. And his idea is that our rationality is limited when we make decisions. And it's limited by a number of factors once the information we have. We don't always have the information. Like in the example with the university, you can estimate the probability of getting an offer, but you actually don't know the probability. We have quite strong cognitive limitations. When you think back to the lecture of, on working memory, how many items we can keep up in short-term memory. So we can't keep all alternatives in our mind. And we often 
have a limited amount of time to come to a decision. You can't think for three years what is the best university to go to, then your peers will already nearly have finished university and you haven't come to a decision yet even. So we have limited time. And because all of these limitations, um, one of the strategies we can adopt is just to find solutions with satisfiers and which don't maximize the outcome. Now how can we deal with this bounded rationality given that we are limited in all these respects? And the answer to that is like in, we have seen in the lecture on problem solving, uh, it's using heuristics. And again a heuristic is in this context a strategy to come to decisions which gives us a solution which is most likely acceptable and good but is not guaranteed to be perfect and optimal. So, yeah, but often it's sufficient for our aims. And the advantage is that it greatly reduces cognitive load and makes us uh, able to, to survive in everyday living. Not every uh, decision has to be perfect, has to be maximized. So, if you think what I want to have for breakfast, well, you could have toast or you could have a cereal. It doesn't really matter whether you have now the perfect choice or just an acceptable choice. Okay, let's speak about the heuristics which are used in decision making. And I created the lecture last year where this uh, plane MH370 was just big in the media uh, where the plane was lost somewhere over the ocean and nobody knew what happened and uh, people were praying and trying to, okay, please let people find the plane and, and things like that. And common decision-making heuristics are satisfying, what we just have seen. Just ignore all the other stuff and come to a conclusion with the limited amount of information we have. And then we will speak in this part in more detail about the availability heuristic, representative heuristic, and a subpart there is gambler's fallacy and recognition heuristic. Okay, let's start with the availability heuristic. So, think for yourself, what are you more afraid of? Flying in a plane or driving in a car? So if you have to make an either or decision, who is more afraid of flying in a plane than driving in a car? Lift your hands. And I want to have your emotional response to that, not your cognitive response, okay? Okay, a few people. Who's more afraid of going in a car? Okay, so not very big participation, but at least I would say a few more people are in the plane. And actually, if you ask uh, people out on the street, a lot, of, a lot more people are actually afraid of flying than driving. But you may know that statistics tell us that it's actually 10,000 times more likely to die in a car accident than in a plane crash. So the question is, why is that the case? Why are people more afraid of flying then? And one explanation for that, and this comes from this concept of the availability heuristic, is that the information about plane crashes usually is much more salient in the media. So it's more available, there's more media coverage more discussions among people. As I said last year with this lost plane you could overhear all the people speaking about that one plane. Probably during the why they're speaking, during their five-minute conversation, more people died in the world on car accidents than were passengers in that plane. <clears throat> so we have you know these uh, symbols people make, we have these big headlines in in the media. Um, I don't know the research in detail, um, but it might be that you get a slight difference, but I would think the overall pattern stays the same, that even, I mean, most people are drivers. So when you look at questionnaire studies in the general public, the majority of participants will be drivers anyway. But you probably could factor in, like, how many years have you been driving? What are the driving abilities of your friends? <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, but funny enough, people are still often not more afraid of driving in the car. So, in an overall, of course there are people, um, especially if you have experienced something yourself, then this may change completely. <coughs> okay, so, and this actually has a practical implication. So, for instance, after 9-11 attacks, many Americans actually were so afraid of flying that they took their cars instead of flying. And usually you then have to travel long distances because for short distance you wouldn't take a plane. And statistics show us that in the th three months after 9-11 in the US there were 350 more people than usual who were killed in car accidents. So just this has an effect on decision making. Do I take the plane or do I go by car? And it actually increased the number of deaths which we have due to transport here. Okay, a more, uh, let's say, experimental approach to this availability heuristic, uh, a study done by Kahneman and Tversky, and that actually refers to the recommended reading for today, that's one of the studies in this paper, is the following. So they did in the 70s, in the early 70s, uh, the following thing. So suppose you have a random word from an English text and you only consider words with at least three letters. And then the question posed to the participants, what's more likely? That you have words which start with letter R or that you have words where the letter R is in the third place, the third letter in the word. So for yourself, think, are there, you could say generally in the English language, more words starting with an R or words where the letter R is in the middle? What do you think? Think for a moment, and then I'll ask you. Okay, who thinks there are more words with an R in the third place? Raise your hands. Okay, a few. Who thinks there are more words with an R in the beginning? Mm -hmm. A few more people think that. And if you ask, do that with participants, actually most say, okay, there are more words starting with an R. When you do actual statistics on text and analyze the occurrence of words in English, what you then find is um, that there are more words with an R at the third position. So the second example would have been the right answer. However, the reason why most people, I mean most of them, don't have this background we have right now about a lecture in availability heuristics, they just try to think in their mind, okay, of words starting with R and words having R at the third position. And it's very difficult to come up with words where R is at the third position. So your internal statistics comes up with many more words where R is in the first place. So that you only have these available and so your availability heuristics leads you the wrong way here in this example. <clears throat> okay, so this was on the availability heuristic. So the information which is available to us influences our decision. And if an information is overdue, pr overduly presented, like plane crashes, then we take that into account and, for instance, are more likely to be afraid of flying than using the car, although flying, flying is much safer. Another example um, is called representative heuristics. And here, let's start with an example. Suppose you play with a friend and you toss coins and you have to call heads or tails. And now he did toss it, you say that, and he did six heads in a row. So it was toss, heads, toss, heads, toss, heads. Now, what's your next guess? Is it heads or is it tails? What do you think is more likely? Who's in favor of heads? Who would call tails? Okay, so nobody raised their hand for heads and most for tails. 
So, and that's what actually many people do. The reason or the logic behind that is because it hasn't appeared for so long. So it must appear now, in the next, next moment. Can't be that you have seven, eight, nine hats in a row. However, from a statistics point of view, of course we assume that it's a fair coin, that the true probability is 50% and not that it's faked or anything. The truth is that each coin toss is absolutely independent from the previous one. So on each individual coin toss you have a probability of 50% heads or 50% tails. It's always 50%, no matter whether you had 100 times heads before or not. And this bias is called gambler's fallacy. Because gamblers often fall for that. I've observed that game. It didn't come for so long, so I will put all my money on that choice because it must come now. That's the logic behind that. <clears throat> so, as I said, because it didn't appear so long, they choose that. And we know, and this is a true thing, that we know that on average there should be 50% tails. And if there have been 10 heads in a row, we think there must be tails coming up next. And this, on average, there should be 50% tails, is described by what is called, and you may have heard that in your statistics lecture, by the law of large numbers. However, when you look at the name exactly, it says law of large numbers. And five or ten coin tosses are not a large number. If you have a thousand coin tosses, you are very likely to have pretty much 50% heads and tails, but not with five coin tosses. So let's have a look at a simulation here. <clears throat> so these are ten examples where a coin was flipped once, then twice, then three times, and so forth, up to a thousand times. And the probability, um, or the scale here says, excess heads over tails in percentage. So if you're at zero percent, you have 50 percent of both. If you're up here, you have more heads. If you are down here, you have more tails. And look, here is already 200 trials, so 100 is here. How, what a large variation you still have. And only if you really go up to 400, 600, 1000 trials, you narrow down and come to a very even distribution of that it's really 50% both. And the gambler's fallacy, what we can keep in our short-term memory when we observe a game or something, we are in that area. So we still are not in the domain where the law of large numbers really applies and would be of use to us. And even if so, in the long run, or each individual coin toss is still independent from each other. Okay, so, and the gambler's fallacy basically is to think that this already happens here. That things will even out in the very short run already and not in the very long run. Another everyday example where the representative heuristics comes into play is when you play the lottery. So I will present three sets of six numbers and I would like you to think about what is the most likely next outcome for the next lottery of A, B and C. Okay, who is in favor of A? Nobody. Who's in favor of B? A few hands up. Who's in favor of C? Again, a few hands up. <clears throat> the truth from statistics is that all have exactly the same probability. Why do we perceive a different probability? That is because we know that drawing the numbers in the lottery happens by random process. So we expect random numbers. And this one looks just, no, this one just looks most random to most people. There is some system here, it's always increasing by 8, and this is always increasing by 1. So for most people that looks most random, so they take that. But in probability, that is just one very specific particular number out of the 14 million, 15 million, like that, like that. 
So the probability is always exactly the same, that exactly these numbers come up. However, you can increase your chance or the um, probability for the amount of money you are winning. And that is because certain sets of numbers are picked more frequently by people. And when you choose th such a number, then you have to share your win with more people. So the best thing is to pick something where most people would say, no, I don't take that because it won't come up anyway. So take that one. Because if that comes up, you may be the only winner of everything. <clears throat> okay, so this is the representative heuristics. We create a representation of things in our mind and think, okay, um, based on that we do the decision. In this example it's the representation of um, randomness. Again another heuristic is, and this is a very basic one, it's a recognition heuristic. And here's the idea, very sim simple thing. Suppose you have, sorry, the choice between two options. And you recognize one option and you don't recognize and never heard of the other option. Then it's usually um, a not too bad idea to choose the one which you have heard of. So usually our people kind of automatically think the one they heard of has a higher value about whatever you ask them. So they just assign that. Unless it's some, something obviously negative. Um, about that. So for instance, um, unless you're German, you probably never have heard of the city of Menden, but uh, even if you're not German, you may have heard of the city of Cologne. So what's your guess? What's the bigger, bigger city of the two? No, I've given away the heuristic most people would use. Most people would say, I've heard of Cologne, so I guess that's a bigger city. It actually is, so that would be the right choice. And there's of course a logic to behind that. Because it is a bigger city, that's the reason probably why you've heard of it. If that would have been the bigger one, then you probably have, would have heard of Menden as well. Okay, very simple, plain, but often useful. Okay, to summarize the heuristics part. The advantage of heuristics is that it al they allow us for quick decisions, that we don't have to think about every decision long times, and we only need rather small cognitive uh, amounts of our demands in that. And they often result in acceptable solutions, which are fine for our everyday living. The disadvantage is, of course, the same as in problem solving is, that we don't often uh, that we often don't get the best solution and they actually may mislead us. <clears throat> like in the gambler's fallacy, which is a real problem for these people. Okay, let's have a break of five minutes. Okay, let's continue. And next I would like to speed, speak about the base rate neglect or base rate fallacy. And I was wondering, did you cover that already in statistics or research methods? Did you hear that? No. Okay. So, um, as I said, it's also called base rate fallacy. <coughs> and I would like to start with an example. And this thing, uh, what we speak about now, it's a little bit a teensy tiny bit, let's say, mathematical or logical, but I think it is because we speak about probabilities. But in my view, it's an extremely important thing to be aware of 
especially for US psychologists because they usually have the reputation of having a good methodological um, education. And this is something which is relevant for a lot of people and a lot of people including medical doctors, scientists and so forth, so forth fall for it and forget about it and are not aware of it. <clears throat> okay, let's start with an example. We have the person John here, just as an example character, he decides to have a routine uh, AIDS test. So, he's a normal guy and doesn't have any increased risk, fa risk factors. And we know that for these people the prevalence in the population is 0.01%. In other words, of the no risk or the population which is at no risk, no increased risk, we have 0.01% of the people in the population who are infected with AIDS, who have HIV. And the test for HIV is a good test in the way that if you are infected then it will detect that with a probability of 99.9%. So that's really high, that's really good test. And if it gives a negative result, then it will identify that or it will be with 99.99% correct as well. So this is the so-called specificity. So in a way it's extremely accurate to detect pay people and very accurate to identify or to be not positive when you're actually not infected. Now John's test turns out to be positive. The question is, what is the probability that he actually has AIDS, that he actually is infected by HIV? What would you think? Who thinks it's 99.9% .9 or above? Okay. The actual probability um, is around 50% only, although we have such a brilliant test available. The reason for this is that it was extremely unlikely in the first place that he was infected at all. This is the base rate and people ignore the base rate in their considerations. They only take the accuracy, the power of the test as a measure, as an indicator. <clears throat> However, the base rate, the probability or prevalence is only 0.01% here. So it's very, very low and people ignore that. And that's the reason why it's so important because even often medical doctors and psychologists and research or in the clinical setting ignore this base rate when they come to a judgment or a decision about how to go forward with that. <clears throat> and so for instance we will see an example calculation in a moment how we come to that conclusion um, but in the example of the HIV test um, I don't know how it is in the UK but in Germany and the US for instance <clears throat> you always have a follow-up test the first test is positive, you do a second test, exactly for that reason. The second test is a slightly different test. And only if both are positive, you can calculate a probability which then actually is very high. <clears throat> so, suppose we have 10,000 people to start with, for the illustration why it's only 50%. And we know the prevalence of HIV is 0.01%. So 1 in 10,000 people is infected. So we know one person is infected, oh, sorry, we stay with that person first. And now the sensitivity of the test is 99%. So what we basically can say, if a person is infected, then this person will be tested positive. The probability of that is 99.9 .9 multiplied with 1, which is basically 1. So these are the hits, the one who really have AIDS and the one who are tested positive. Now we have 9,999 people who are not infected. And the specificity 
of the test tells us if a person has no HIV, so these people, the test will be negative in 99.99%. So when we multiply that number with 99,999, we will see that it's 9998 people. However, we also have the specificity telling us that if a person has no HIV, the test will be positive in 0.01% of the cases. So on these numbers, we will have one false positive test. Now the problem is, when we have a positive test result, we do not know, do not know whether this is due to a truly infected person or due to a false positive. So with these numbers, which are actually rather accurate regarding the true prevalence of AIDS and the test performance, actual tests are, if at all, have a slightly lower specificity. So the problem is even more severe than here that with the outcome. But in this example, we only know the test is positive. And in, with these numbers, we have an equal likelihood that the person is truly infected or that it's a false positive from this huge non-affected group. And that's the reason why it's just 50%. If the numbers would be different and it would be two persons would be false positive and one person we already would have only a probability of 30% that it's truly, uh, that the person is truly Positively, truly positively infected. Sorry, getting confused here myself. Okay, so just as an illustration, another example, and I won't go through the mathematics here, um, but just to make you aware of the problem, because it's something which is often discussed in the media, especially by politicians. Suppose you have a city where one million people live and 100 of them are terrorists. Consequently, 999,900 are not. So the base rate to be a terrorist is 0 0.0001, so it's very low. Now people suggest we install surveillance cameras with face recognition systems. Assuming we know the 100 terrorists, we have pictures of them, we don't just know where they are. And the sensitivity, sensitivity is quite good. In 99% of the cases, if the camera sees a terrorist, it will raise an alarm. I think most engineers would be happy if they could develop face detection systems which, with such a high accuracy. And the specificity is quite good as well with 99%. If the camera sees a non-terrorist, it won't ring in 99% of the cases. Okay, you may anticipate the question, the alarm goes off. What is the probability that you actually caught a terrorist? You can follow the numbers with the link I provided from Wikipedia. The actual probability is 1% only. Although we have such a good system, if people would tell you we have a face detection system which is accurate in 99% of, of the cases. And again the problem is this extremely low base rate. That it's extremely unlikely that a person passing the camera is a terrorist at all. <clears throat> so the relevance of that is uh, only if we have unequal distributions. If we would have 50% terrorists and 50% non-terrorists, this wouldn't matter, because then we can really take the specificity of the test or the camera system as an indicator of the performance we expect. It only becomes relevant the more the distributions are unequal. <clears throat> the second reason why it's relevant, I mentioned that already, because so many people fall for that. And it's important to think about practical implications of that. So does it make sense to test all people of a population for AIDS? This is sometimes suggested. No, it doesn't. 
because you would have an extremely high number of false positives. You would have to retest them, you create panic in a lot of people, and it's very difficult to identify the ones who are truly, truly infected. And the same thing, unless you have much, much more accurate systems, is it worthwhile to have face recognition systems? Well, that, of course, partly depends on your political standpoint, but uh, most people would probably then say, well, no, it isn't, because you have loads of people you identify falsely positive as a terrorist, and then they are suddenly in the situation that they have to defend themselves and prove their innocence, which shouldn't be the case in the Western states and civilization. Okay, any questions on this base rate fallacy? Okay, then let's get to the last part, which is social cognition, which is a bit shorter than the other parts. And Okay, so let's start a little bit broader with the idea of what social psychology is basically. And one of the big social psychologists is Gordon Allport and he defines social psychology as the aim to understand and explain how our thoughts, feelings and behavior is influenced by either actual imagined or implied presence of others. So, social psychology looks at this part where we can't do studies by ourselves, but where we are on the influence of other people. And the standard topics of social psychology research includes, for instance, the attitudes towards other people, attributions we make, uh, the influence of being in a majority or minority, obedience, prejudice, things like that. And traditionally, there always has been a rather close link between social psychology and cognition. Because a lot of these things, like um, forming uh, attributions, for instance, um, are based on cognitive concepts, like schemas, like uh, memory stores or memory traces we have stored. So in social cognition, we look again at the intersection between cognitive and social psychology. And in particular, emphasize on the internal processes which happen in our mind in social interactions. So the question is how do we process information about the social world, like other people and ourselves? And we can distinguish a couple of topics here, and we will speak about them in a bit more detail in a moment. So one is how do we perceive other people, social perception. Another area is how do we form memories about other people, so social memories in short-term and long-term memory. And how we make inferences about other people, like the decision-making processes. Okay, let's start with social perception. <clears throat> and here the point is why it's so relevant is that the way we perceive a social situation largely determines our behavior. You may think very basic, you may enter a group of people you don't know and either whether you perceive the situation as either uh, friendly welcoming or hostile rejecting makes a big difference on how you behave. And the perception of social situations often happens automatically beyond our awareness. And again, like in decision making we have seen, we have a pretty strong tendency to simplify complex social situations. So this has been termed cognitive misers, that because, again, due to our limits in attention, short-term memory capacity, we have to um, minimize our processing and use heuristics, and in the context of social psychology, it's also called attributional biases. But the basic principle is the same. Why it, that's the reason why it links into cognitive psychology. And when you think about our limits, when you think back about our lecture on attention, for instance, or short-term memory, when you enter a room with 20 people in there, 
You know what, that we perceive consciously only things where we really put our attention on and focus on. And we usually don't really focus on each individual person and consciously perceive the social state, let's say, the person is in, whether he's friendly or not. Usually we can just enter a room and directly have a social perception of the social state. So this cognitive miser's idea is pretty um, comparable in a way to Simon's bounded rationality and decision making which we just encountered. So one heuristic or way to minimize our cognitive load is just to spontaneously categorize situations and people. Okay. And again we use heuristics for that and these categorizations uh, run in a certain sequence, let's say. So when we meet a new person we usually immediately make very very wide-ranging ideas and impressions about that person. And it has been shown that when, when we evaluate people a very first and basic judgment we make is whether we like them or not. So, then we use more like central traits like is the person good or bad, warm or cold, potency, strong or weak, and activity, active, passive. If you see some relationship to the emotional dimensional models like valence, positive, negative, like dominance, arousal, then this is um, partly probably due because Osgood works in this domain as well. And only after we have done these very basic rapid uh, evaluations we do on a more detailed level like education, intelligence, age, things like that. <clears throat> and when we do these attributions or these um, quick impressions forming things, there ha happens something which is called the halo effect. And that is that we tend to be consistent with our impressions. So for instance, we perceive people as consistently good or bad, no matter what they do, even if we have contradictory information. So suppose you meet Superman and he runs somewhere and he pushes an old lady off the sidewalk. Our initial interpretation is probably he must hurry to save a school bus of little children falling into some uh, deep hole or something like that. We don't think, oh he's a bad guy, just pushing an old lady. The same way if we have some villain like the Joker and he helps an old lady over the street our first thought is probably, ah, he might have stolen her purse or something. We don't think, well, he's done some pretty bad things, but he has some good sides as well. That's not the way we think. So this is the so-called halo effect. So, and we actually have to sometimes really distort new information to keep our image up. Another study in that respect is it done by Dion and colleagues and they presented pictures of people uh, which were previously rated with respect to physical attractiveness. They were either low, medium or high level of attractiveness and then people just saw these pictures and were not informed about that attractiveness was actually a variable which was manipulated and they were asked to judge and rate these people on a number of dimensions such as social desirability, personality, uh, professional happiness, status, things like that. And what they found is that attractive people tend to receive higher ratings than unattractive people. So this halo effect has this idea of we try to create um, an idea of a person which is consistent, which fits some stereotypes of people. Somewhat similar to that is a so-called person positivity bias. So that in general, oh I forgot something, just remind me on that. that. Um, 
I have the module evaluations which you have to fill out that neatly fits in here uh, you will see is the tendency to evaluate other people positively of course this is now just accident that I have the module evaluations here and at this moment I wanted to hand them out in in a moment uh, during the break um, so in a study with American college students 97 percent of the professors were rated as being above average which of course logically doesn't make any sense because it should be only 50 percent 50 percent should be below average the interesting point is that this really referred only to people and persons it does not extend to the evaluation of courses so may I ask you to evaluate this course and um, maybe one person needs to collect that at the end and bring that to the Marie Jehoda uh, not sorry the new office the, in the Heinz Wolf in the admin office in the end I will just quickly hand that out so that you still have some time Pass that around. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, to summarize the part on the social perception. We have seen that social perception is influenced by our cognition cognitive abilities. For instance, our limits again and attention and uh, working memory make it necessary that we have to use heuristics to pick up the information we need. <clears throat> and we have seen the halo effect and the person positivity bias. Okay. And what we basically do here is that we kind of try to fit schemas or prototypes to a person because we tend to simplify in that way. <clears throat> okay, I'll wait a brief moment while you spread the papers. Okay, so in social situations we also come across um, our memory system because we may, for instance, um, remember a certain person and the associations with that. And here is the important, uh, the concept of a schema important as we spoke about in our earlier lectures. So in this example we have Brad Pitt and in a schema we have associated information for instance about his partners, we know that he's an actor, we may remember the movies he played in, so this is information which is stored in our long-term memory and which is connected to each other in a certain way. <clears throat> so when we have schemas then we um, have this access to information and knowledge in a structured way. Just to give you a quick reminder, schemas were something like the schema or the concept of a room where we say okay we need some basic information or basic features like having walls and a roof and a floor. <clears throat> so schemas help us in simplifying complex situations and they make our processing more efficient and consequently enable us to act quickly as we heard before and there are very different types of social schemas the schemas themselves may not be so different to the other schemas we have encountered however now they are put into a social context so we may have schemas about ourself, it's self schemas and it's always the link to cognition is that these are memory structures so they have the same properties of decaying, of being able how many to remember and so forth 
We may have schemas about specific individuals, like the example of Brad Pitt, about groups of people, for instance group stereotypes, and so forth. So we may have, most people know that image, so a, this is an example of a distorted self schema. We have seen this example of a schema about a specific person, and we have, may have schemas about groups, either distinguished by their color or uh, a schema about family members or that we have the idea okay a family is a certain group and we associate certain roles with that and so forth schemas also apply to the roles we occupy in social situations and so and the scripts that means how to behave so for instance the schema of a medical doctor usually is that they are diligent that they care about people do their best to help you and so forth so this is when we see a doctor then immediately we have that schema available with all the associated information with a doctor and we had the example of the script which is a schema for a sequence of behavior the example we actually had was a social situation so these scripts help us to more easily navigate through social <coughs> complex social situations <coughs> these schemas are learned they are not like inborn or natural and therefore they may be affected by culture and so for instance the schema people have about Barack Obama in the US and in the Iran may be quite different about the conception of this person however even subgroups within the same culture may have different schemas because they have a different peer group and learn differently so for instance the schema of certain polit politicians in different social classes the drawbacks of the schemas are that they are inflexible we can't easily change them because they're rather fixed memory structures we have they direct our attention to certain points and we have seen this confirmation bias for instance again with this that we don't and this this halo effect <coughs> that we again more are likely to input social informa uh, supporting information which is in line with our general perception or hypothesis okay so to summarize on that um, the categorization of other persons is guided by schemas so you could say again this is an example that we are cognitive misers these schemas are cognitive memory structures in long-term memory so if you're very strongly interested in that aspect from a social perspective then you still it's still helpful to have this background in cognitive psychology okay coming to the last point of today social inferences <clears throat> so when we interact with people then we continuously try to make inferences for instance what is their intent of a certain statement are they liking me disliking me do they still want to stay in the conversation do they maybe want to move on or something like that a lot of that happens unconsciously so we try to do that all the time <clears throat> things like that so how do we make these inferences that's one of the questions again from this cognitive psychology point of view and again there has been proposed a rational model of inf inference making here so the idea being that we gather information from around us which is rather unbiased and then we combine it in a logical way so again the questions are human rational in this context now this time in social interference not interference social inference <clears throat> and again as I already announced at the beginning we will see that throughout the whole lecture uh, we are not rational we are cognitive misers 
And we will see a study in a moment which shows that when we gather information, our attention actually is biased. For instance, by prior expectations. And again, coming to this confirmation bias, uh, we, tried, we usually focus on consistent information. Okay, let's have a look at the study done by Hamill. And in this study, participants viewed video clips. And in these video clips, they have shown either a rather friendly prison guard or a cruel prison guard. And then they asked the participants, after they have watched this video, about their attitudes towards prison. And not surprisingly, when we have the mean attitude here, with higher values meaning more positively, more positive attitude towards prisons, people who saw the friendly guard have a higher or more positive attitude as compared to the uh, cruel guard. Now that is not very surprising. However, they had an additional manipulation in their experiment, which makes the study very interesting. And that is that before they saw the video clip, they were given some information about the guard. And they were either told nothing, so it was like a neutral control group, or they were told the video clip, the guard you will see in a moment, is very, very typical for the situation in prisons. That was one group. Another group was told, well, you will see a guard, but please remember that's a very atypical, untypical example of the guards in our prison system. The question now is, how does this information about the typicality of what they see influence their attitudes toward prisons? Well, the answer is, Oh, the click. Oh, yeah, now it's coming up. It virtually has no effect. So, even if I tell you, hey, you will see a friendly guard, but that's absolutely not typical for our prison, implying that most guards are cruel, you're still more positive than watching the cruel guard. And even if I tell you, well, you will see a cruel guard, but it's really not typical, so most are uncruel, then you're still worse. There's a moderate effect that these two are closer to each other than here when it's the typical information, but overall doesn't make a profound effect here. So what they have shown is that our attention is biased towards the behavior of the guard. We just take this, what we see, as granted. And it also shows that the information people have available is just simply ignored. It's not taken up at all. And it doesn't change the attitude. Participants were aware of that. After the study, they have been asked, um, do you remember the information about typicality? And they were able to say, yeah, I know that was an untypical guard. They were able to reproduce that. They just didn't use it. So this shows that our perception and the way we make inferences based on what we see is extremely biased in this social context. So it's not this idea of, okay, our mind and perceptual system is uh, geared towards creating an objective uh, representation of our surrounding world. Okay, to summarize that. Inferences in social interaction are based on information we take up from our environment. However, this information is not unbiased and combined logically. Instead, it is very biased, like this confirmation bias and this ignoring of information. Okay. We already had that. Yeah, um, this example of the typicality of the prison guard could be seen as another example of the base rate neglect. Because when I tell you this is a very untypical example, then this basically means there's a very low base rate and it occurs very rarely, but we still ignore that. 
Any questions on that? Okay, can I ask for one volunteer who picks up all module evaluation forms and brings them to the TPO office, the ground floor and Heinz Wolf building? We are, as lecturers, not allowed to do that so that we are not able to move away the ones uh, which we don't like or something like that. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Okay, then please uh, collect everything and we will see us next week. Uh, for executive control, which won't be part of the exam, and then in the second part, some exam preparation, which will basically be the same talk I'm, I've already given, but again with an opportunity for you to ask questions about the exam. Okay? Oh, yeah. And because the question came up a few times via email, for the exam, the book. The textbook is relevant and the lecture is relevant. <clears throat> However, from the textbook, only the chapters we covered here is relevant. But I get emails which say something like, okay, so many people told me you only need to read the lecture. You need to rehearse a lecture. No, that's not what I said. It's lecture and textbook. Okay? Then see you next week.